finance expert and MeVest founder, Leslie Ann Scorgi, joining us on Canada Now. And Leslie Ann, your latest article in The Star discusses buying a house with a friend or family member and living with them. You know, pooling resources is becoming more popular these days. Right. And, um, you know, whether you call it intergenerational wealth transfer or the fact that you just want to save a pile of money, what we need to understand is this, this has been going on for centuries in many cultures and it works well, but the only way it works well is if we treat it like business. So it is full of some complexities when you're buying with a friend or family. And so therefore you just have to be clear with boundaries, like most things in life, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and you spell it out in the piece, um, you know, avoiding the negative that can come with an idea like this, because there are plenty of benefits to, to pooling uh, resources. Firstly, know the financial situations of the other parties involved before committing. Oh my goodness. So here's picture this. Okay. So you think you're going to buy with like your cousin and when you're in with the banker, you find out your cousin's actually been terrible with paying their bills on time. Do they seem like the ideal partner now? Absolutely not. And this happens, you know, more times than not when you are co-buying. So my advice here is get real with the other party. Have they been bankrupt before? What is their, you know, what's their past history of paying their bills on time? And frankly, like how have they been effective or not effective at, at saving and managing money? So you do not want someone who has, let's say a negative credit score or like a bad reputation with money on your co, like on your registration documents for that property. And here's another thing to think of is like from the bank's perspective, whoever is on that mortgage, whether it's you or your cousin or your uncle, everybody can be held liable. So if your cousin pieces out and does not want to pay the bill, you're going to be paying the entire portion, not just your half. So have a legal agreement in place. Absolutely. So legal agreements, you know, they, they come with a bit of uh, a rug, right? Because anytime you get lawyers involved, some people say it gets complex, but let me correct that. I actually think it gets more clear. The more you iron out the framework up front, the more clear it's going to be. So here's where a lawyer can help you. They can first off, like a prenup, help you determine is who's going to be responsible for what and how are you going to own the property? So is it like a 50, 50 split? Is it a 40, 60 split? Uh, who's going to come up with the initial down payment? And uh, what I think is almost even more important is there's like two primary structures for co-ownership. One is think of it as if you were married to the person. So if you passed away or they passed away, the other half of the house just flows to you automatically. But there's another situation where it's more like a friend situation, where if the other party passes away, their portion does not go to you. It goes to their family and the estate. Now, that's some big stuff to actually work through. And you'll want to be clear on that in advance because my goodness, if you're not, and you know, death happens upon you or your co, you know, your co uh, habitant, you could be in deep trouble. Well, absolutely. And, and maybe to a, a lesser extent, uh, maybe not with, with legalese, but determining who uses that space should be established first off and, and, and how maintenance is going to be handled as well, because you don't want to have those conversations of, well, I thought you were going to do that. I thought that was, I thought that was a, a you thing. Can you imagine, like, I'm thinking the scene from Home Alone where the burglars are walking down the front steps and they're completely icy and, you know, up goes the feet and you, you fly flat on your back into the sidewalk and it's because nobody cleared the walk and the walks are completely icy on purpose or not. So you don't want that. You want to be so clear about who's going to do what and be clear to the point where you're talking about, is it okay to have the TV on late at night? Uh, which parts of the house are you going to be allowed to use? Like if you get downstairs to do the laundry and you're both there at the same time, 
what do you do? Or the other person leaves their laundry in for three disgusting days while oh. it collects mold. Oh. You, you probably had that roommate long time ago, but that could happen again in your adulthood. In this yes. co-ownership arrangement, if you're not super clear about who's going to do what. Well, I guess establishing costs uh, as well, the ongoing costs post-purchase, you know, how those are going to be paid, better figure that out too. Totally. So one of the systems is like you pick one person who's hopefully the most responsible person to pay all the bills from the, their account. So you would e-transfer them your portion of the money, they would pay all the bills. Or another method is that you have a joint account and everybody contributes their respective portion to that joint account. And the good thing about that is most of the stuff can be automated. So the mortgage payment, the utility payments. So as long as you keep that account funded, you should be okay in, in terms of like getting it all paid, <laughs> not yeah, missing and, anything. And just keep an eye on it. That's all. And, and, and watch all the automated payments uh, go through and, and check them off as you go. Um, the agreement, how much flexibility should there be in it? Well, like I'm a big fan of, of high degree of flexibility if you're going in for co-ownership because life changes. So you or your friend could get married, have children, get divorced. You need some flexibility. So sometimes when you're co-owning, contrary to popular, all the popular rage right now, a variable rate open mortgage might be better for you where you can get out of that agreement easily. The fixed rate mortgage is uh, pretty binding. You can't easily get out of it and it can be quite costly to break the mortgage. Uh, in my opinion, co-ownership requires as much flexibility as possible and you know, go easy on each other too in the process. Yeah. Uh, take your time. Uh, don't jump into this. That's another reminder from your piece in the star. Now let's go back uh, a week and a half uh, to another piece you wrote, Leslie Ann, about getting the maximum price out of your real estate sale because selling your home could be your, your most valuable asset and you want to make sure you get it right. Totally. And now we're looking at the other side of the equation. So let's say you got to get out of a real estate transaction, whether it's co-ownership or you're solo owning. Um, there are actually six, six-ish techniques that I would recommend that are going to get you some serious big bucks when you sell. And the, why you would care about this is you want to capitalize on the demand. You want to capitalize on the fact that especially right now, first time home buyers are going nuts with the interest rates being so low, that's driving up demand, uh, but there's extra value that you can add. And the first one that comes to mind, this first tip is just about, um, it's about clutter. And the, the data that I was looking at, it was hilarious to go through, but the, here's the deal. Nobody wants to see your clutter when they're going through a house. They don't wanna see your pictures. They don't want to see your kids' toys. And like, I'm guilty of this. Like I got squeaky toys coming out of every corner <laughs> of my living room right now. Um, like every nook and cranny of your home needs to be decluttered. And guess what the data says? One little box, also known as a Rubbermaid bin. If you put a full box of, of or sorry, a, if you fill that box full of clutter, it's going to add between $500 and $1,000 to your sale price. So in my opinion, pack it up, my friends. Totally. Get it out of there. I, I remember uh, when I was house shopping uh, years ago, I went into a house that was beautiful. Like I, I, if the price were right, I, I, I would have bought it. Um, but I think the price was a little high and I was like, eh, I don't think so. Uh, but what completely ruled me out of buying that house was every in every room in the hallways, kitchen, bathrooms, there were pictures of the 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 homeowners' dogs in oh. every everywhere I turned to I every time I see a Dalmatian, I think about this house. Two <laughs> Dalmatians in every picture in every room. And I just couldn't picture myself living there because it just felt like the homeowners were were there, but they weren't there. You're driving home the point. The fact is you couldn't picture yourself there. So if you can't picture yourself in a home, um, you're not gonna buy it. And so decluttering actually helps you 
clear that away and allows the potential buyer to really vision themselves in the home. So totally valuable. What do you do home improvement wise? Oh, there's a big myth that you need to do major renovations in order to get major dollars. And I am here to correct that myth. (laughs) It is not, um, it's actually not a very reliable way to increase your sale price. So what ends up happening with these major renovations is they end up being over budget and often not what the ultimate buyer wants. So it's actually better when you're doing uh, improvements to actually limit the upgrades to what has to be fixed. So if your home is in disrepair, um, you know, fix it. If you've got, you know, a hanging light fixture and is dangling literally by the cords, like fix that up. Then you can go through a series of high impact, low cost improvements. And these are things like just swap out those dated like fixtures, get some new ones, swap out the faucets, make sure they're not leaking. Uh, If you need to change out the dirty carpets and and refinish the hardwood. And above all, my aunt's a very well-known interior designer. Here's her number one tip. Paint your house a designer white because it makes the house look bigger. Ah. Oh, I so thought simple. maybe because it was like kind of like a blank canvas, like, hey, I can do whatever I want here. <laughs> There's that too. But uh, what a simple tip. And apparently simply painting the designer's white can also add another one to 5% on the value of your sale price. That's an excellent tip, one that I had not thought of. Uh, keeping the place clean as well to a point where you would get it professionally cleaned, that that's something you remind us uh, in the piece. Uh, the importance of a realtor. Get the oh. best one you possibly can. Totally. Like, this is not where you want to mess around. Like, so uh, I get it. If you maybe have had a bad real estate experience in the past, mm-hmm. you might not want to, to hire a realtor. But uh, sh- statistics do show that they do produce better results and can save you from some pretty nasty legal issues. Absolutely. I've had, I've had a, a terrible realtor and I've had the best realtor and I still have uh, the, the best realtor. Um, they'll, they'll price your home properly and, and do it at the right time. Of course, uh, get out of the house when you're showing <laughs> you're, I, as a buyer, whenever I've gone to see a home where the, the homeowner was there, no chance I'm buying the house. So totally. if the realtor is suggesting it, maybe get out of the house. But you know, if you're showing your home, get out. I don't want to see you there. Like, don't take it personally, but nobody wants to see you in the home. And yeah. if your realtor is telling you to leave, it's because they want to show your house in pristine condition. So get out of there. Don't look back. It's not a personal thing. They just want you to to get out. So the key here when it comes to a sale, I get that there's so much emotion here, but you got to park your emotions. You need to be clear headed and you need to listen to your realtor so that you can be strategic in getting that best price and best value. Absolutely. Uh, check out mevest.ca, personal finance expert, mevest founder, and baby Hank's mom, Leslie Ann Scorgi. Leslie Ann, always a pleasure. We'll do it again next week. Thanks, Jeff. We'll see uh, you next week. Thank you, Leslie Ann. Montreal Canadians, uh, 